He is the host of Ask Dr. Drew, formerly of Loveline, of international fame. He is Dr. Drew Pinsky, and I'm excited to have him joining us once again here on The Will Cain Show. Dr. Drew. Will. How are great you, to have you here on The Will Cain Show. Pleasure. Hey, um, Dr. Drew, I want to start today talking to you about um, these videos coming out of people walking up and down our streets wearing the new Apple virtual reality goggles. I've seen videos of people driving their cars while tapping in the air while they augment their reality. I've seen people walking down the street and even crossing crosswalks, you know, seemingly pounding out some tweets or, or some emails while they, while they commute, in that case, walking in their life. It, it occurs to me, and I know you know this, Dr. Drew, that you, you can look at charts of the rising rates of depression, especially, especially among young women, and it mm -hmm. correlates to essentially the introduction of the smartphone and social media, those two things happening roughly around the same time. Direct correlation of living life virtually and comparatively as opposed to reality and the, the rising rates of problems in mental health. What do you think about now augmenting our reality with these Apple VR goggles? Well, I doubt it's going to move things in the right direction, right? Uh, obviously, this is a concern to everyone. Uh, you know, underlying all of it is the fundamental issue of disconnect. Uh, humans are have evolved to require bodies in space, people next to each other in connection in order to develop a sense of self, in order to develop a landscape of emotional regulation, in order to find meaning, in order to live a good life, which is something that people have lost track of completely in this country. But we are certainly uh, devoted to our, uh, our addictive substances and our addictive uh, sort of visual and auditory experiences. And this is, you know, it's going to make things, I, you know, it's funny, uh, Scott Adams was talking this morning, he said, you know, if this were a pill that was having some untoward effect, the FDA would, you know, immediately cancel it, would send it back for lots more study. But because it's merely a technological instrument, and having God knows what impact on the brain, we just move right on. Here we go. Yeah, and we I don't want to be. I don't think you want to be. We don't want to be dinosaurs. It's we don't want to I mean, I don't know. Sometimes I toy with the idea of anti-technology, but it's all part of our life. It's 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 unavoidable, I think, unless you're ready to be Ted Kaczynski in Montana. No, well, but the, the point is the, the impact you brought up earlier on young girls and the, the impact on the developing brain is different than on the adult brain, right? The the, the developing brain is highly plastic. And we should be ex limiting contact the way we should deal with all this screen, whether it's, uh, you know, something you wear in your face or something you hold in your hand, the way we dealt with tobacco. It really should be considered that dangerous for adolescents and dealt with accordingly. At very minimum, parents as a group have to understand they need to limit contact because, of course, if you're the only parent limiting, limiting contact, your kid's buddies are going to show them, oh, look at this, when you the lunchtime at school, of course, it's all going to come, come raining in anyway but limiting contact and then focusing really just spiritually and philosophically on what is important. What is important is so much more nourishing that it will naturally pull people away from these screens. The problem is they have a, they have a significant pull and the opportunity for the kinds of things that are meaningful either are unknown to people or certainly are not emphasized. You said at a minimum, by the way, parents should be the regulatory mechanism, but I heard yeah. you as at a minimum. Do you think the government should step in and start you, you compared it to tobacco? Do you think no, technology no. Well, at social a minimum, media, no, no, no. I, I am not reality for, should be regulated? <laughs> less government. Leave me alone. That's my general that's the, the headline <laughs> over my head. Leave me alone. Um, but at a minimum, I was saying at a minimum at a minimum limited to two hours. I, obviously the reason I framed it as such is you're not going to limit tobacco to two hours a day, right? If at minimum limit two hours a day, but eliminate it entirely. If you as a parent group decide that's the appropriate thing, fine, do so. But at minimum, limit it to a very narrow period of time. But you don't think it should be the subject of regulation for children? You know, it's, it's, I, I have not really thought it, I, I might, you know, my general position is stop. No, 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 <laughs> no the government, that's going to, government is never going to fix, make things better on any, on anything. I just, I can't think of anything that the government makes better. So I'm not imagining they would come up with some magical solution here that will make things better. So I'm generally, no, stop. It's on us. It's parents. Oh, here he goes. Will's on his phone. Watch out. Well, I wanted to <laughs> pull up a tweet. Can you hear me when I talk to you? <laughs> 
<laughs> I wanted to pull up a tweet that I uh, that I um, saw about something you had said recently. It ties into what you were just saying. I do have the capability. I'm I'm very special in this way of of listening <laughs> and also preparing. Wait till, wait till your brain gets uh, older. It's it, it's uh, that that's a curiosity based tends to go away. up to what you're talking about. <laughs> no, you were talking to Dave Rubin, and yeah. you were talking about. Your, you know, you talking about your philosophy basically of more go- or less government is always better. Um, you were talking to Dave Rubin about. I hate to these terms all get so loaded as we move along and they make yeah, their way well, into the zeitgeist. But basically, okay. of you becoming red pilled in essence, oh, yeah. that you do yeah. not trust anything from the legacy media anyway. Is this yeah. a new place for you? This like skepticism of government and media. Yeah. I mean, it took a while to get me there. I mean, to the degree, like, like, I mean, I've had such varied experiences. Like, for instance, dude, I was on CNN HLN for years, almost a decade, and no one ever told me what I needed to say at HLN. I did, me and my producers, we did our thing, we produced stuff, and we thought we were doing the right thing. And, we, you know, when the audience respond, we certainly went in that direction. And so we ended up doing a lot of Casey Anthony and uh, Jody Arias and things like that back in the day. Uh, but no one was ever telling us what to do. Then I had an experience where um, I used to do John Lemon's show almost every night, and I was talking about Trump and his personality and some of his hypomania and talking. Then I started talking about other presidents that have the same thing. And I was saying, you know, be very careful when you pass judgment using all these slogans and, and psychiatric terminology, because some of our greatest presidents have had some serious liabilities psychiatrically, but they've been great leaders and great presidents. And uh, the next morning, my radio producer, my radio director says, hey, that was great. Could you do 30 seconds on that for our radio show? And I went, yeah. And uh, I did it uh, for our for our website. And he goes, you know, we have to balance. You know, we could, could you do thirty seconds on Hillary? I go, yeah. The fa- fact is, um, they released her medical records this morning, and her medical care is atrocious. There's really some serious problems. So I addressed each of the problems with her medical care. Next day, Drudge Report r- reports finally a physician says she's not suitable for office, which is not what I said. And of course, things that go viral are never what you said. That's that's one of the lessons yeah. about social media. It's never what you say. It's always what somebody said you said. So that was one of my you know, experiences with that. And two months before, I had met with the CNN brass, w- wonderful people. I mean, really, I would go to the mat for most of those guys. Ken Johns, guys like that, they were they're great managers, great professionals. And he told me that the show would be canceled two months before that episode. But they kept it going, and the, the cancel date was a week later after this whole dust-up on Hillary. So now, for eternity, it goes down as Drew was canceled because he said something about Hillary. Which, A, what I said about Hillary was not what I said about Hillary, and the cancellation had nothing to do with that whole thing. It's not, this is this is media. So you know when and and God forbid, Will, you must have had this. Somebody in print writes a story about you. How how often do they get half of it right? Never, right. never. It's always outer space what they report. And so you have enough of those experiences, and you start thinking, oh, maybe they're just always like that on everything. And that's the fact. That's the truth. Well, you know, my experience is, is similar to yours. In my and I have spent a great amount of my career in quote unquote mainstream media. I need to own mm-hmm. that with the audience. I mean, I had worked at CNN as a contributor. I was at ESPN. I'm now at Fox. Yeah. And I'll tell you, Doctor Drew, the number of times that I have been told not to talk about something is very rare. And I will say that yeah. most of the time, yeah. it revolves around something to do with a potential defamation case. Because most or, of or, or just America, generally some some active legal case that the attorneys, not the yes. network, says, "Hey, tell these guys just to leave that alone while we're working." Correct. On the case. Yeah. Lit- the litigation and the potential for litigation yeah. is maybe one of the biggest emphasis for self-censorship yeah. that exists. Yeah. Um, but what I, that doesn't mean there's not bias. Don't get me wrong at all. I mean, there's huge individual bias. There's institutional bias. Um, I'll just cultural, give you this example. And I, I have I, right? cultural kind bias. Of cult- I have yeah. fond memories of my time at ESPN. But if if I talked about a trans issue... I would need to balance it out. And I was happy to balance it out because I, mm-hmm. I enjoy debate and interacting yeah, with people that sure. disagree. Yeah. But if I said, if I had an opinion that was somehow in the more groupthink deemed acceptable lane, I didn't have to balance that out. I never mm-hmm. had to have somebody, you, you know, tell me, I, don't, I can't think of an example off the top of my head. You got to pull this guy in from the right to tell you where you're wrong on this, Will. It was always, you need to pull this person in from the left if my opinion was outside the lane 
of acceptability. That's where manipulation came in. But it was very rarely, hey, do not talk about this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm with you. Uh, uh, and yet, and yet, the reporting. I, I, I wonder. I always wondered how it got so distorted, so wrong. Like, uh, it, it, in other words, is it at the producer level? I mean, where, where it? Because you know, as you and I both know, a lot of the producers are like 25 year olds just out of school and smart, eager beavers. But they, they're sort of selecting the stories, and they have their own sort of world they live in. And I remember once I went to a um, opioid summit at the White House. And it was a great day. I mean, it was incredible. All all these cabinet level officials came in and presented what they were going to do. During, this was during the pharmaceutical disaster. And I've been fighting it for years and years. And Jeff Sessions, God bless him, came in and said, you know, I see what's going on here. I can fix this. I, you watch it. Six months, I'm going to turn this thing around. And damn it, he did. At the end of that day, a lot of interesting data was presented. A lot of interesting people spoke. At the end of the day, unexpectedly, Trump marched in and just started talking the way he does. And he goes, uh, you know, uh, and I noticed the room filled with reporters as he as he walked in. There, there were there were maybe 10 times more than there were during the day. And uh, he said, and, and towards the end of his comment, he goes, glad you guys are working on this. Keep going. You know, I don't know. You know, some countries, they make the dealers pay the ultimate price. I, I don't know if we should do that or not. But, you know, I'm glad you guys are thinking about everything. So next day, this entire day of extraordinary presentations, not one media outlet reported anything at all except a headline trump says uh drug dealers should be killed that's it that was the entire day and i thought really? oh i can't i can't believe anything that comes out of this this building it, this is ridiculous so again and again and again i just i see it that it, and where it's coming from it, you know there's no mustache twirling you know snidely whiplash in the background but there is something going on where the press has been so severely adulterated that we have to kind of look elsewhere because you can't rely on what they're what they're telling us. Hey, you said something fascinating. You talked about um, the twenty five year old producer or the corporate environment. I brought up the yeah. litigation thing, you know. Um, and I think COVID was a big moment of revelation on this for me. And this mm -hmm. is where I bring in sort your your medical background. I used to think, Doctor Drew, that at our base level, the 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 motivation of human beings is usually um, somewhere in the vein of greed or ambition. That, that, mm. that people, when reduced to their base level instincts, will pursue their own self interest. But I was, and that may be true, but I was wrong in that that means they will do what is best for them in terms of pursuing ambition or success. And that's probably because that's how I think. And I was, my, my bias was, was personal. Mm. What COVID showed me, and what I think the corporate environment shows you as well, is most people don't go through the world actually trying to achieve success. Most people go through the world actively trying to avoid failure. And COVID showed me how fear is our base level motivation. I think mm. when you boil us down to, to we're the little lab rats and how do we make the lab rats move in directions that we want them to move, or even if it's not, you know, as you said, the, the mustache twirling individual trying to make us move, the way that we do move is fear-based. COVID was shocking in how many people yeah, would shocking. do anything that was told to them because they're afraid. What do you yeah. think is our base level motivation? Is it fear? I, 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 it's too hard for me to, to talk about single motivations. You know, I work in the world of broken motivations, right? Addiction medicine is about brains that have been usurped by one motivation, which is do drugs. And it's interesting how all the other motivations shrink away and all the systems in the brain that come in to service the motivation, we're, we're complicated beings. I, I don't, I don't like distilling us down to one thing, but fear, no doubt, is a very powerful, powerful motivator. But within fear, there are sort of subcategories, right? A lot of people, one of the great fears that evolved in our hunter-gatherer societies was ostracism, right? If you left the group, you would die. If you were ostracized, you were sent out into the savanna or whatever, and that's it. You're done. We we need social context for our survival and for our thriving. And there are many other motivational systems along with attachment and love and all these things that that we they're positively affirming as well. And let's not let's also not forget the brain has two powerful motivation systems on the positive side, which is wanting and liking. We have two different. We want certain stuff and we like certain stuff, and sometimes they go together. And then we have a negative side. And fear certainly, you know, uh, has it, particularly negative social input, which fear is quite attached to. 
uh, you know, you see, uh, uh, you're walking through the jungle and you see a leopard, you're going to have a much more powerful reaction to that than anything else. I mean, it has a prioritization to it, but it's not always a priority. And within that fear is fear of losing our social status, our social context, our tribal membership, all that stuff figured in with COVID. And uh, man, did they take advantage of that. Wow, it was phenomenal. I, I never imagined. I thought... I thought humans ended that in 1948 or in 45. I, I thought that was about the end of that. We'd done it on such a scale that we would not see that again. And now here we are at 1790 in this country. Uh, it's, it's revolutionary France all over again, psychologically. <laughs> what do you mean by that, revolutionary France? I wrote a book on narcissism called The Mirror Effect, and I, and I was I was documenting the narcissistic trends and turn and how you know personality structures had had dramatically changed, really internationally, and uh, and I wanted to write a chapter on you know where else in history because I wanted to know what the consequence with this. There's got to be other periods of history where this has happened, and the only thing I could find that was similar was pre-revolutionary France, and so I wanted to write a chapter about how you know narcissists tend to form mobs and scapegoat and that I would you would see guillotines and this was 20 years ago I, I didn't know cancellation was not a word social media was not a word I didn't know that that this would be the 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 modern version of the guillotine but here it came it came and the mobs and the mob action it just all came now uh it, what's interesting is how to how we dissipate all that and uh, it, it usually takes some firm muscle to do so. If you look at history again, it didn't stop in France until Napoleon stepped in and go, okay, that's it. And the thing that people forget about guillotines is if you put somebody on the guillotine, eventually you're going on the guillotine. It needs to stop. You know, I am fascinated and I, and I will admit it's always been on my list to study in more detail the French Revolution because, you know, uh, uh, it's a good side by side why the why the american revolution was a success and why the french revolution was a failure i've never thought about it through the terms of narcissism it's, when you were talking about politicians a minute ago i also used to think like the commonality to all politicians is narcissism i mean I, those those that pretty, i've been around it's a pretty fair but so you're pointing out <laughs> you're pointing out it's not just politicians though we're a narcissistic yeah. society Oh yeah, absolutely. I I I, I was I started working in a psychiatric. I'm an internist by training, but I was working in a psychiatric hospital starting in 1985. And when I first got there, you know, we had these diagnostic sheets on admission, and I was seeing you know personality disorders at the top of the list. And I would see all kinds of different personality descriptors and you know per dependent personality, obsessive compulsive personality, and all these different things. And somewhere in the late 80s, I noticed oh awful lot of borderline personality coming in. And then by the 90s, by, by 92, it was all what's called cluster B, which are the narcissistic disorders. So it's borderline narcissist sociopath. 100% of you, the admissions. Huh? Why, where'd that come from? How do you explain that transition? Childhood yeah, like trauma. how do you go from we, a society we had, we had where massive, you're over, over sick, indexing sick, bipolar to narcissism? Sick Wait, say that again? No, no, it wasn't bipolar. It was, it was, it was all sorts of disorders, then borderline, and that which is Borderline. a cluster B disorder, and then only cluster B disorders. Uh, and we had a pandemic of s destroyed families and severe childhood trauma in the 60s and 70s. You weren't around for this, but the 70s was perpetrated on children. Hey, man, do whatever you want to do, whatever your wish is. Kids are just little sexual beings. If that's what you want to do, fine. It was horrific. And it, it those mm. people were now coming into their 20s and 30s. Uh, in the 80s and 90s, and it and I was talking to them on the radio by I, every night. Every call was was a consequence of that experience, and so that's I had kind of had an eye out for it. And that continued for 20 years. 20 years. That's that's all we heard: childhood trauma, childhood trauma. And finally, my profession, uh, you know, acknowledged. Oh, it looks like oh, adverse childhood experiences, the ACE scale. Oh my goodness, it turns out adverse childhood experiences you know, cause psychiatric illness and affect people's overall health. Huh? Shocking. Oh my god. No kidding. Fascinating. So you point to the destruction, well, in part, destruction of the family, but just what we, how we started to treat children as this yeah. transition that led to um, this epidemic of narcissism. I'm going to follow this curiosity. It's something and, I thought about asking and, and, you. And Will, um, Will, I want to shout you real quick, real quick. You talked about the French. The French, during the pre-revolutionary period, brutal to kids. 
like something like three out of five really? kids, they're just arbitrarily left at orphanages. Only one fifth and one one twentieth of those kids survived. I mean, it was horrible what they did to kids. They, they any attractive young, you know, fourteen year old was sent into prostitution. It was wild. What was I, what, if you really and the French gloss it like, oh, just libertinism. It's just what those guys were into and we do a little bit of that in here too about the 60s and 70s so i'm sorry for interrupting you go ahead wow i would have to think dr drew that we're even doing it at a greater scale now than the 60s or 70s i mean i, I we're pretty libertine it, it, at this moment in in, no, in in our in our country it, no it's no? different yeah, yeah having lived through both it, that that was uh different uh, people are are much more <laughs> much more uh, disconnected and isolated. I think the, the screens may be preventing from some of that stuff. Who knows? But oh. uh, but it's much, you know, you I occasionally see people say, well, I want to bring back the free love of the 70s. And I think, oh, no, you don't. By the way, that was all perpetrated by adults with no understanding that adolescents and young adults would follow suit. That's, why, that's how I got involved with the radio. I was 24 years old, and it was considered bizarre to talk to a 17-year-old about AIDS. Because why would they need to know about that? Think about that. That that was 1984. Yeah. What did Napoleon do? You said Napoleon comes in and puts a stop to this. To well, it just so it's a coup at the a moment of the French Revolution. Military coup, essentially. You're talking about at the moment of the French Revolution. You're talking about a, a, a society that's already gone through that libertine moment. It's now got a, a, a population of narcissists all coalescing into mobs and guillotines. And then you said it stopped with Napoleon. Why? A military, military coup. And, and then, of course, he took all that unregulated. The narcissists have a lot of unregulated aggression. And one place to focus it is in the military. You can take them all into the military and then focus on a common enemy. Scapegoating is the mechanism that narcissists use collectively to manage their their aggression, their anger. Uh, scapegoating is a terribly pathological thing, and when we are deep so in Napoleon's, it so Napoleon's so um, Napoleon's military expansionism, his mm -hmm. his goals brought all of this. You're telling me brought all of this um, narcissistic society that was turning in on itself and focused mm -hmm. it and channeled it outwards in a way that I, so serviced it's pretty Napoleon. broad it's a pretty bold statement i've never really said it quite that clearly it's pretty bold you know and it's it's weird to me you gotta remember napoleon was italian he it's napoleone bonaparte was his actual name he was he didn't speak french when he got to the military academies in france he was corsican italian and uh i wonder that maybe he was able to perceive things differently because he came from outside that culture it's kind of interesting to think about that but but stuff like that, you 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 you. It's worth look, Will. It's worth your time to study these things because yeah. we are woefully absent on the historical, uh, you know, under, you know, uh, those that failed to study history are doomed to repeat it. We we just seem to ignore that, and it is a true history does not repeat itself, but it certainly has echoes. It certainly kind of goes in some sort of. You can learn something from the past, that's for sure, because it's all about human beings after all. Here was the point of sort of personal curiosity that I wanted to follow with on this conversation. Um, anyone who's interested, and look, there's, uh, I'm not going to belabor the personal sides of these things, but anyone who's interested in children and whatever it be, adoption or foster care, mm -hmm. there is a conversation that is always had about, well, what trauma has this kid experienced and what can be fixed? I had an interesting conversation recently that I thought, I want to ask Dr. Drew about this. I had never heard of RAD. Um, mm -hmm. and yeah. are you familiar with rad? Oh, I've seen it, treated it, dealt with it. It was, we had we back okay. at the psych hospital. We had lots of that, uh, with the Romanian orphans coming over. I don't know if you remember, but Ceausescu so the, had tell me if I... boxes, essentially, where, you know, being treated with machines, essentially, or, you know, one nurse for 30 kids. And, uh, those kids were, oh, horrible. So tell me if I, um, characterize this correctly, but a child, a person, can be fairly resilient and overcome trauma, provided that trauma happens at a stage of life where they can reconcile with it. And the theory is it's the first six months of life, actually, zero to six months where trauma or neglect or abuse becomes insurmountable. And that a child who has dealt with that in their first six months, and I hate to say it this way, but cannot be fixed. They, they can't form normal human empathetic relationships. Everything becomes somewhat transactional. It's a lot of the characteristics of, sounds like to me, I'm no psych, psychiatrist, of a sociopath, but it's sad to think whatever happens in those first six months, if this is accurate, and I turn to you, is not capable of being fixed. 
Well, it, you, you know, everything in medicine is not always and never, right? But uh, that that phenomenon of extreme deprivation, particularly the first six months, f- first five years, if it goes long enough, it doesn't it, you know, even the first six months are good. If you have it the rest of the way in the first five years, <laughs> you can end up with the same thing. And I, I think the the more um, gentle way of saying it is there's only so much you can do. Uh, and some of them are really not retrievable. And it's closer to psychopathy and not sociopathy. In other words, other people don't really exist to them. At least their minds don't have contents in any meaningful way, certainly not emotionally. Sociopaths at least understand that minds have content, but you're there to, you know, to serve them, to be manipulated by them. But psychopaths, emotions don't really exist. And that's part of what gets lost in that attachment disorder. All right, back to your your distrust, your growing distrust or your developed distrust of mainstream media. I know you also have said this as well, that a big part of that was uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Mm. Well, I, I that, people ask, you know, Michael Malice, I think, was the first one to ask me, what was the moment? You know, it's, it, when people ask you on our interview show, you have to come up with a moment. It, it may not be exactly the moment, but it's the one that comes to mind. It's like a Rorschach test. And what, and what came to mind for me was this interview I had with RFK Jr., with, which a friend of mine set up, Dr. Kelly Victory set it up, and uh, I really didn't know what, what, what his deal was. I, I'd heard all this, you know, oh, he's a vaccine, blah, 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 and I thought, what, how am I going to find any common ground with this guy? And, and by the way, I didn't like the way he has his formulation on the AZT history. I was there. I was in the trenches. I was working on AIDS patients. I knew exactly what happened, and he, he got it wrong. Um, not entirely wrong, by the way, but but wrong, in my opinion. And he and I fought about that during this first interview. And then he started talking about, you know, what he wanted for vaccines and for vaccine research. And I thought, well, that's reasonable. That's not at all what I thought this was going to be. So first, you know, first aha was like, oh, of course, the people were saying he said something he didn't say. There we go again. It's never what you actually say. It's right. always some cartoon version of who you actually are. So that was the first moment for me. But what really um, stayed with me was at the end of the interview, he goes, you know, Drew, you, you are really courageous to speak to me. And I was like, great. To have a conversation with another adult professional in public requires courage. He goes, oh, you wait and see it. You're going to see it. This requires courage. I was so gobsmacked, met fury, meets furious about that. I thought, well, no one's going to tell me who I can talk to. And this is ridiculous. And then I got assailed by the, you're platforming, you're platforming people. <laughs> that is that is McCarthyism writ loud. That is never going to be seen well but in the light of history, when the, the bright light of history is going to, uh, it's never the good guys that prevent people from speaking. And my opinion is, I, I don't have to agree with people, but I'd like to talk to them and see what's up. And by the way, so I ended up I ended up like really interviewing a lot of people that had, you know, peripheral opinions that I didn't necessarily agree with. And I learned something interesting from every single one of them. I didn't agree with everything they said, but I learned something that I wouldn't have learned any other way. Yeah. You can't trust humans to listen to a conversation. Uh, it, it's just, oh my God, it, it's just been so disgusting to me to, to see people go down that path of, of, of trying to silence people's points of views. It's just horrific. But what is it about Robert F. Kennedy Jr.? For me, just that he said that yes. to me. That was it. No, it was nothing special about him. And 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 I've sort of become kind of friendly with him since. And I, he's an interesting guy. He's a smart guy. He's done some interesting work. Oh, it's Robert F. Kennedy Jr. that told you about platforming. And I thought it was Michael No, no, Malice. he was the one that so said Robert F. Kennedy Jr. You're, he said you're courageous for yeah. interviewing me, meaning him. And, uh, and oh. that's what triggered all my thoughts about that. Oh well, he has certainly experienced that. I mean, uh, he, talk about talk about the 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 fear of ostracization. Uh, and again, mm-hmm. this isn't about. Yeah. Um, you were talking. I, I, forgive me. I thought you were talking about Michael Malice's opinion on AZT. You're talking uh, about RFK Jr. Um, yeah. RFK Jr. I've I've heard him talk about. It. He's lost it in terms of ostracization. He's lost almost everything, including his mm-hmm. family. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And and by the way, again for for the promotion of an opinion, for for being accused of promoting an opinion that is not his. <laughs> that is not his opinion. That's the part that people. That's right. the part that people need to watch out for. And ha, and ha, look, this is this is. I, I want you, you. I know you're sort of fascinated by history. I want you to think about this. If if I were to, I'm not going to make you answer this because it's you know, again, it's 
well, people are just asking things on the spot in a podcast, but who is the greatest, the most se severe disinformation promoter of all history, of historical time? Who, who was considered the most outlandish, suffered the most consequences, had the most uh, threatening opinion, and by the way, threatened the fabric of not just society, but the church and God. And so was put before the Spanish Inquisition. His name was Galileo Galilei. He was accused his entire life of being a disinformation spreader. Really? You want to you want to cancel the next Galileo? Is that your plan? Shh, give me a break. You should be disgusted. You should be disgusted. No, yeah. they're not all Galileo, but Galileo is going to be in the mix down the road there somewhere. Now you see the headline. Dr. Drew compares RFK Jr. to Galileo. No, they're gonna. I'm just gonna say compare myself to it or something. It's gonna be something. It has to go toward denigrating. <laughs> oh, you're the me Galileo. <laughs> and you're, yeah. you don't worry. You'll get caught in the crossfire. So. <laughs> don't you dare silence me. I'm very well could be Galileo. <laughs> Uh, back to narcissism. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. you know, let's, let's bring this full circle now with the Apple VR and, you know, Elon Musk is pioneering Neuralink. So it's like the Apple VR and our, 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 uh, detachment from reality. Yeah. It's, a, it's a subway stop on this train headed to who yeah. knows where. I mean, yeah. this thing's going to be implanted into our brains and we have no, you know, it's interesting. You could argue what is shared reality? We, I, I have, yeah. I have um, been a big believer in objectivism, you know, objective mm -hmm. reality. I yeah. do increasingly understand people live through perception. People yeah. live in different realities. So mm -hmm. I don't know how big of a leap that it's going to be, but we are definitely going to crystallize this idea, Neuralink, Apple goggles, that we yeah. all are in separate realities. So, so I would have been uh, five years ago, if you said this to me, I would have gone, well, stop being hysterical. Well, it's going to be good for people with neurological disorders. You're, you're so fearful of tech. Don't be so afraid. And then COVID <laughs> and, and all the, uh, the sort of realizations of, of how far our government can go and people can go. And now I'm, now I'm scared. Now, now I, I'm with you. I don't know where this is going to go. I have concerns about it. Now, I actually have two more serious concerns. Um, one is this is a part that people do not know. And, and Elon Musk doesn't seem to understand. And we'll see. We'll see if this is true or not. But in my experience, if you do so much as put a hole in a skull, like put a burr hole in it, you risk changing who the person is. Their personality changes, their mood changes. There are profound consequences. Forget putting a knife into the brain, just putting a burr hole in the brain. And if you're now going to lay a piece of plastic on top of that, you're killing thousands of cells that we have no idea what the full impact of that's going to be on who the person is this 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 is the same thing with hallucinogenics and stuff too and although i'm a fan of them therapeutics down the road but it's risking changing who somebody is and the ethics of changing the foundation of the person you know because you give them a chemical or put something on their head i i mean it, there has to be a profound risk reward consideration in doing so and let's remind ourselves these plastic instruments in the brain they wear out, have to be replaced every so often, and that's going to kill another yeah. God knows how many cells. So, so the profound neuro, neurological consequences of this have yet to be worked out. Now, if it's to make it so you don't have a neurodegenerative process, or it somehow impacts ALS, or you know, uh, spinal cord injuries or something, well, no, maybe it's worth it now. But for an average person, oh no, no, this is I don't I really worry about this. I think it is a very wise, and I have come to appreciate that word, smart, less meaningful to me, wise, more meaningful as I grow older. I think it's very yeah. wise to, to say, well, we need to consider. We didn't, I don't think we talked enough, shockingly, about the, the effects of the legalization of marijuana. And you bring up hallucinogens. Right now there's a big push. Hey, they're good. They're good. They're good. And I'm not sure I've heard anybody really, to the extent you just brought up, like, Bring up well, whoa, whoa, whoa! What is the downside of toying around well, with did this? Did you see that kid that and cut just, his dad's we've lost head off? Wisdom. The kid, the kid that died, the kid that cut his head off. That no doubt in my mind that was from heavy LSD exposure. I've seen stuff like that from LSD, and he was a well-known heavy, heavy hallucinogen user. I've seen people get really wild psychoses. I've seen people's personality change. I've seen uh, severe mood disturbances. How much for how long before that happens? We don't know yet. That's what scares me. Now, I, I do believe there will be therapeutic value. I mean, there's no such thing as a good chemical and a bad chemical. It's just 
chemicals, their effect on the human ph physiology and our relationship with them. That's it. Uh, there are some good, some bad, you know, alcohol, some good, some bad fentanyl, good, good medicine. And if you're having surgery, not so good if you're living on the street. So, or not so good if you're think you're, you're 14 and buying a Xanax tablet, uh, that, then not good, but it depends on the context. Well, as to bring this together, you know, what we like and what we want sometimes gets in the way of, of pursuing that wisdom. This is the second time we've talked. I find it, a, I, th I find it useful in that pursuit of wisdom. Enjoy talking to you, Dr. Drew. Always. I hope Thanks, we'll man. have you again here on the Will Cain Show. All right. All love right. it. There Good he goes.